We continue our conversations on the doctrines of the Pearl of Great Price. With us today are members of the Department of Ancient Scripture, Professor Camille Franck, Professor Joseph McConkey, Professor Richard Draper, and Professor Michael Rhodes, and I'm Robert Millett. Let's begin with uh, a question. Why was the first vision given when it was? Why didn't the first vision take place long before? Uh, people often say, why did it occur in America? Why, did, why wait until 1820? What were some of the factors that would contribute to the first vision coming when it did come? I think one of the things we've got to understand is that history was moving forward. Uh, I am disturbed because I hear from time to time that the ministry of the Lord failed. Uh, after all, the apostasy set in very, very rapidly, 100, 110 A.D. We have no priesthood on the earth. Truths are being lost right and left. And, and people feel that somehow it didn't, uh, what Christ wanted to happen didn't really happen, it didn't come off. But I'm distressed because I think that's a very narrow look. The world was pagan. The world was pagan. And even though the ship of Christianity itself was taken over, as it were, by other leaders, and even though the old logbook that told the direction it was to sail was tossed overboard and a new one supplanted, the ship itself remained. And that ship battled successfully against paganism. You know, it, it wasn't the true church, but it did bring forth Christ, and it brought forth the teachings of Christ. It did things to the world that had never been done before in a very large, uh, in a very large scope, on a very large scope. And in doing that, it prepared the world itself just for the name of Christ, for the idea of Christ, and for the unity that, that we should strive for in Christ. And so I, I think all of that had to go on so the, before we're ready for a so restoration. So the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was not planted in a non-Christian world. Exactly right. Okay. What else? Why? until 1820, in addition to what Richard has said. Uh, any other thoughts? Well, you had to have a place. And uh, even a superficial knowledge of the history of Europe would uh, frankly disqualify it as the place. It, it, Europe is really a battleground of religious uh, bigotry and has been for uh, hundreds of years. Thousands. Uh, thousands, uh, yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, uh, and still uh, is today. And still is today, but, but, but not like it was then right, in right, that yeah. uh, uh, you could hardly go to a graveyard in Europe without finding the, uh, the graves of martyrs. And, and uh, the church in power is, uh, uh, is in power, be, frankly, because it's got the sharpest sword and it, it reigns for a period and somebody else, it's got the muscle and somebody else takes over. And this is just back and forth and back and forth. And, and frankly, it, it's about as ugly a history as, uh, uh, as we have anywhere. I'm, I'm reminded of a story uh, that I heard years ago of a man, you may remember this man, man named Michael Servetus, who lived in the days of John Calvin, who chose for some reason to oppose Calvin on the nature of God. He believed the Father and the Son were separate personages and that the, and that the Scripture set that forth. And so that was, that was the only crusade, if it were a crusade, that he was on, that he believed the Scriptures taught otherwise than what uh, some of the major thinkers proposed, um, he was, he was uh, taken, beaten, uh, hung, and then burned at the stake simply for opposing the, the major thinkers, this in the 16th century. I've tried to picture an Orson Pratt or a Parley P. Pratt going through the streets teaching what they taught in the 16th century. Um, and, and when you think about it, the church just barely made it with, uh, with persecution all about in the 19th century. Yeah, see, people say, why the Book of Mormon? Why does it have to come forth in America? Well, gracious, you've got uh, Tyndale is uh, strangled and burned at the stake for giving us a translation of the Bible in the English language. 
Well, all right, is this the environment that you'd expect the Book of Mormon to come forth in and have a chance to survive? Well, no, it just simply can't take place uh, for a couple of hundred more years, and uh, even then you're going to have to go uh, someplace else and get a fresh start on this. What about, what about family backgrounds? Uh, a little bit about Joseph Smith Jr.'s family that would contribute to the, to the, the coming of the first vision. The idea that they as a family, because of religious beliefs, would be ostracized from the community was not new to the Smiths. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hazel Smith, Joseph's grandfather, he's called old Crooked Neck Smith, and he, uh, he was unchurched because he couldn't uh, square the religion of the day with the, uh, with the Bible. Yeah, Joseph, uh, uh, just pick up on that one. When we say unchurched, we don't we don't mean irreligious. Not irreligious, right. no, not at all. Joined a religious body. He, he, he wouldn't affiliate with uh, any of the uh, denominations of the day, but a very very devoutly uh, faithful and uh, what we would call today, I think, uh, religious man, mm -hmm. who prophesies that he would have a descendant who would do a work that would revolutionize uh, the world of uh, of faith. Uh, and who had the opportunity to verify that his grandson, Joseph Smith, was the uh, fulfillment of that prophecy. So he's a prophet in his own right. He's got a father, as you've noted, who, uh, who dreams dreams. He's got a mother who has the habit when there's a question that troubles her soul, finds a grove of trees and grows out and prays. Uh, this kid's a product of his environment, isn't he? He's a product of, of the family that uh, he was raised in. So we have not only a, a, a young person in Joseph Smith, Jr., who brings with him, surely, a capacity from pre-mortal existence for, for spirituality, but he's raised in an environment that encourages it. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. It's just yep. natural to him. I think when you have questions, when he says, I found out there was no other place I could go, going to God was, an, was very much a tangible option, that something that he was mm -hmm. raised to understand and think was very natural. Let's talk a little bit about the climate in the sense of the religious setting. One of the phrases that Joseph uses in writing his history of this is that there was a war of words and tumult of opinions. Um, let's talk about, for example, about what that would mean in terms of, oh, let's pick uh, some doctrines. Baptism. If I had grown up in the early 19th century, what might have been the differing views on how baptism is to be performed? Oh, you're going you're to run the gamut. There will be those who will insist on baptis baptism by immersion. Okay. Uh, that is to say, all the way under. Many every Baptist hair. groups would have been that way. Uh, absolutely. And then you can run across even to the Universalists who, it's almost a baptism of the heart. It's a baptism of the soul or the mind. We don't really need to get into the water thing about it. So I mean, it's, it's going to run the, the gamut on this one. How about uh, man's role in the salvation process? How would the, how would the views differ? Let's take uh, Michael. Well, again, you, you're running the whole gamut from those who, who would uh, think of man as, as primary, primarily responsible for his salvation. Such to as uh, Methodist. Methodist, yeah. To those who, who would uh, say man doesn't even play a role. Calvinists who, who, you know, absolute predestination. And, and Joseph often, interestingly in his sermons and writings, would, would put those on the two mm -hmm. uh, poles, as it were. The Meth Methodists teach one may uh, fall from grace but regain. The Presbyterians teach that one cannot fall from grace. So you have that disparity. But what you're illustrating here is when the sure voice ceases, when the notion becomes that the heavens are sealed, every doctrine is up for dispute. How about uh, Godhead or Trinity? Well, I just stated it. Uh, yeah. We've got, That's exactly we've got right. those yes. who believe in a Trinity notion, Trinitarian notion. Interestingly, we have groups like the Universalists or the Unitarians who believe they're separate and distinct, but spirits. Mm -hmm. um, how about maybe, but maybe the most unique thing here is you don't have anybody that is, to, is going to declare that uh, what Joseph Smith eventually declares, particularly by the time we get to the King Fall at Discourse, plainly and clearly, that if the veil were rent, you would see that God is a man like yourselves. We're talking about tangible, corporeal, uh, 
resurrected, exalted man. Nobody held that view. Right. The one thing that was lost to everybody was the truth. <laughs> authority? Mm. Uh, yeah, again. What about the issue of authority? What would a good, uh, a good Roman Catholic have claimed about authority? Sure. Uh, we've got the... I'm having a hard time talking today. We got uh, the succession from Peter. Okay. moving all the way through, and therefore authority is based on primacy plus tradition, and, and it reaches right back. You've got to know your line of authority. What would a good Baptist have believed? Authority is a absolutely unnecessary. Priesthood of all believers, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Priesthood of all believers. So, so when he says war of words and tumult of opinions, I don't think we sometimes appreciate what we're dealing with here. Even in his own home, let's talk about that for a minute. We've got, we've got a, a few little differences here. Uh, what, what are some of the dynamics of the Smith home? Lucy Max, good uh, Scottish girl. She so she's a Presbyterian. So she's attracted to Presbyterianism, which, which is, again, believers generally in the five points of Calvinism, in, including predestination. Joseph Jr. says that he's attracted to Methodism, which will be on the other, other end. And we've got Father. He's in the image of his father. Who, who's a universal again, Unitarian. Yeah, just, yeah, but, but unchurched. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you, you can come to appreciate the, the challenge, though Joseph Jr. knows you go to God with your questions, though he knows that spiritual experiences are real, we have some differences not just in society, but some interesting challenges even in the family here. You know, it, it's interesting, after his vision, when he leans against the fireplace, mm -hmm. he says to his mother, I have found out that Presbyterianism is not true. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He doesn't tell us what mother said, did he? No, he didn't. <laughs> Good point. But probably got sent to bed. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the significance of James 1 and 5. Um, what, what do you feel about James 1 and 5? What might be said about what, what might well be called a foreordained scripture here? Well, is it one of the things, before we get to James 1 and 5, could we talk just about the book itself for just a second? Sure. Uh, James was one of those highly debated books in the, in the councils dealing with canon. There, there were those who did not want James to become part of the canon. Fortunately, the voice on the other side was stronger, and therefore when push came to shove, James was indeed placed in the canon and became a canonical book. But that disputation continued down to the days of Luther. Well, that's exactly right. He called it, what, the epistle of straw. straw. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, so Justification. It, because it, it sounded as though... It's in opposition to what works, Paul is writing, and you've got to faith. take one or the like other. the faith and works issue is taking mm -hmm. another pole, as it Well, he's, he's saying, too, that it doesn't profess Jesus. Say. Uh, that, that's a nicer way for uh, him to put it, but, but he didn't want to translate it and uh, put it in the back of the book and didn't, wouldn't yeah. give it page Leave numbers. It so it had had a stormy past, as it were. Yes, exactly right. Uh, and, and therefore, I see an opposition to the book because, as, as you I, uh, said, we, we've got a foreordained text here. Yeah. And I'm not surprised, therefore, that it, there would be some controversy that follow this. would draw the same this. opposition as a uh, foreordained prophet. prophet. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly right. Now listen to the text in context. What are you reading from? I'm reading from James. Here's something that a lot of Latter-day Saints have never done, is just read James 1 and 5 in its context. Well, why don't you begin with verse 1, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Joseph? That's, that's uh, where you've got to begin. Uh -huh. Well, first you begin with the name of the book. This is mm -hmm. the general epistle of James. So it isn't written to a particular congregation, like many of the epistles were, but this is uh, written to uh, all of the saints. And then it begins. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> he's writing to, I mean, how, how in the world do you do this? You sit down on Sunday afternoon, you say, I'm going to write a letter to uh, somebody, and you write a letter to the twelve tribes <laughs> who, who are, are scattered. scattered. Yeah, yeah. Yes. and then greeting. Now, uh, I don't know how, what kind of postage you put on that or how you address the letter. But how do you expect this message that you're going to write to get delivered? Who's going to take it? But that doesn't seem to be James's concern. Well, he has no concern That's about right. it whatsoever. It's as if he senses yeah. it'll go to all the 12 yeah. tribes. Yeah. And then he launches into this little mini-discourse on patience, which is just kind of interesting. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 
And then it's after having said that that he makes this great announcement now, if any of you lack wisdom, you say, let him ask. Now, the setting is just remarkably which, which is still, interesting. If you continue the context, it's still in the context. You pray, God will answer. Yeah. But that, that answer requires works, requires then for us to do something. Do it something. isn't simply just giving us a response to, to re answer a question, but that uh, allows us or gives us the responsibility to go, go forth and do now based on that. Well, it's, it's a qualified text too. I mean, if you lack wisdom, didn't say if you lack right. money or you wanted to be more beautiful or you want to be more famous or something, this is the wisdom of heaven. If you, wanna, if you want the wisdom of heaven, then heaven's interested in responding, mm -hmm. you see. Yeah. Uh, Which is an excellent qualifier. Yeah. <laughs> One tradition, it's a little hard to tie down, but it seems to be a pretty strong tradition, is to the effect that young Joseph heard a minister preach on James 1 and 5, and that was what motivated him to go home, look up the passage, study it over, uh, and then it had that impact. In fact, I think it's worth our time. Why don't we turn to Joseph Smith history? Uh, and read uh, what I think is one of the great graphic descriptions of the power of pondering on Scripture. Verses 10, let's do 10, 11, and 12. Camille, are you there? Mm -hmm. In the midst of this war of words and tumult of opinions, I often said to myself, what is to be done? Who of all these parties are right, or are they wrong altogether? If any one of them be right, which is it, and how shall I know it? While I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the contest of these parties of religionists, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Upbraid meaning God Chew doesn't out. upbraid, huh? Chew out. Yeah. yeah, angry with. He won't get angry, get angry for asking. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. Well, I need to interrupt there. You have just read one of the finest scriptural descriptions of the spirit of revelation that you'll find anywhere. Yeah, the confirming okay. power. See, what's happening here is Joseph is having a revelation that says, Joseph, go get a revelation. Mm -hmm. See, revelations beget revelation. revelation. Sure. And so in a very real sense, the, the greatest revelation of our dispensation may have been this revelation that said, Joseph, go get a revelation. <laughs> That's right. It right. Yeah, the Holy Ghost is working on the young prophet. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, showing look, the he's way. Doing. The Holy Ghost is working through an institutional revelation to bring about an individual revelation. revelation. Well, I'll, cont I'll finish Start this. Start again with verse 12. Okay. Never did any passage of Scripture come with more power to the heart of man than this did at this time to mine. It seemed to enter with great force into every feeling of my heart. I reflected on it again and again, knowing that if any person needed wisdom from God, I did. For how to act, I did not know. And unless I could get more wisdom than I then had, I would never know. For the teachers of religion of the different sects understood the same passages of Scripture so differently as to destroy all confidence in settling the question by an appeal to the Bible. I know you're dying to say something about that. Uh, <laughs> Brother McConkie, you had a, a look in your eye. Say something about that. I think that that is the most important uh, instruction that has ever been given to a missionary or anyone else that goes out to share the message of the gospel with those not of our faith, and in a very real sense, even with those uh, who are of our faith. And that is uh, what we need to do is uh, extract ourselves from the war of words and the tumult of opinion. And uh, we need to have uh, a religious experience that is immediate and personal. We need to do what Joseph did, and that is get in, in tune with the heavens and not get lost in uh, this... Uh, War of words uh, and tumult of yeah, opinions. Yeah, this big battle that has been known to Europe for the thousands of years again. Which, which assumes that one of those that are <clears throat> battling is, is true. Yeah. And, and, and what we do by 
by petitioning God as we get far above that and see that there is a whole different view on right. things that anyone on the. And he's just saying, get out of that. Yeah. Let's get up here. Let's. What we need to learn to do is stand on our own ground, on our own revelation. See, the great message of the missionary is we got to teach you how to pray. You've got to get into and have confidence that you can get an answer. That we right. believe that this James uh, one and five is as true for you as it was yeah. for Joseph. You see. Mm -hmm. And we all start at the same point. We start where Joseph started. It, it, it's an independent revelation. We love the Bible. We cherish the Bible. We, we all teach the Bible. But uh, one doesn't go to the Bible to establish the restoration. Yeah. Um, or their, their relationship with God. I think there's a tremendous formula there. Notice what he does. There are two things stand out for me. One is he reflects on it again and again. And I think subtly, notice, he takes it from its, what, 50 A.D. context and jerks it into 1820. In other words, there's that likening experience that he, he gains right off the bat. He doesn't just assume that James is talking to people in 50 A.D. He assumes that that principle has an everlasting import and relevance. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and so the, the, the doctrine is that if he spoke to one man, mm -hmm. If we can find record anywhere that he spoke to one man, then we know that on the same conditions and terms he must speak to everyone. And it's nice at this point that Joseph does not have a title, does not have a position in society that would then dictate that those type of people are the ones that God speaks to. He is a, a boy mm -hmm. yeah. of no reputation whatsoever at this particular time, and God speaks it's to no him. No respecter of persons. Yes. <laughs> Let's, let's turn our attention now to the vision itself, uh, the appearance itself. Um, we're aware that there's more than one account of this. Of course, what I think we could say, the most beautiful account, uh, the most complete account, is what we have in the Pearl of Great Price. That is the 1838 account uh, dictated by the prophet, uh, the canonized account, the account in our standard works. But there are others. Uh, we have an 1832 account, the earliest, an 1835 account. We have an account that uh, was written in, as a part of the, the, the uh, Wentworth letter in 1842. And so um, let's talk just for a moment about each of those, and then we'll dive in uh, and talk about the theological significance that's set forth in the Pearl of Great Price. But let's first say something about each of these accounts. How does the 1832 account strike you? What is it about this one, Michael? It's, it's uh, a little more personal. Uh, first of all, uh, God is speaking in the first person rather than, than saying he said. It, it, it gives the first person. Uh, he um, tells Joseph that his sins are forgiven him, which we don't have in the 1838 account, you know, right. which, which is a, one of the reasons he went to, to God in the first place. So it's is, personal as well as institutional. Exactly. Exactly. It's obviously searching for the true church, but he's also searching for remission of sins. Mm -hmm. There's something else that comes out in 1832 that I, th I think it's highlighted there better than anywhere else. Joseph is concerned about his personal sins. He is also s concerned about the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, uh, uh, there, there, both of these things are impin impinging on this very s sensitive soul. He is genuinely concerned that he might be lost. He is also genuinely concerned that the world might be lost. This phrase, at about the age of 12 years, my mind became seriously impressed. I don't think my mind was impressed with anything seriously at age 12. <laughs> no, <I mean. laughs> Notice, with regard to the all-important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul, which led me to searching the scriptures, 12 believing as I was taught that they contain the Word of God. And as he does, what does he see? He sees that the world is not living in a way harmonious with the Scripture. And it's, it's bothering, it's bothersome to him. It's not, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're preaching one thing and you're, you're doing another. And that's very, he's seen that. It's obvious he's seen that. It's also interesting that he says uh, that uh, he labored from the uh, age of 12 to 15. You know, this, this wasn't just an overnight thing. Yeah. This is something he had worked at for, for years. Which you, is a pattern with the James 1.5 that we just talked about, right. about thinking things over and over again. And being patient. Right. Another one of the things that's really uh, touching about this account is the, the language that he uh, uses it to conclude the experience. He says that he uh, was filled with love for many days mm -hmm. and rejoiced with great joy, if you will. 
And then he said, but he could find none that would believe uh, the heavenly vision. But it's, it's interesting, too, in light of John's proclamation that God is love, Joseph Smith now goes forth to profess the true God, having experienced that love. I mean, that, that love is in his bones now, and he's, he's going to believe him. He's just utterly frustrated because nobody believes him. And, and not only that, the reaction isn't, oh, that poor wayward kid, let's put an arm around him yeah, and straighten bring him out. Him in. It's kill the kid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've got to put an end to this. We, uh, there's just absolutely no Christian love shown to uh, the world's most perfect witness of Christ. I've heard Joseph teach more than once, and it's a great principle, and that is this. We can only know the truthfulness of a religious matter by the quiet whisperings of the Holy Ghost. But you can learn something about the significance of a religious matter by the kind of opposition it engenders. Good and point. the first vision just has to be an example of that. Other illustrations you could think of would be the Book of Mormon. What is it about black letters on white paper mm -hmm. that encourage people to do good and love the Lord and keep the commandments and trust in Christ that engenders such opposition? You could, that same is true with the doctrine of only true church. Or the book of James, as we were talking about yeah. earlier. <laughs> because that's really James's message, wasn't it? Why all the opposition to this, the most do-good-oriented book in the New Testament? Practical religion. Yeah. But people yeah. You got to live it or it doesn't count. Or temples. Yeah. I mean, that's good. If I didn't know by the power of the Holy Ghost to my soul that what goes on in temples is eternally significant, I might sense some things up by the way people react to the announcement of a building of a temple. You know, literally all hell breaks loose in an area when we announce we're going to have a temple here. And so, how about the 1835 account? This is a, this is a different kind of account. Do you remember anything about the background as to how this came? Some, Joshua the Jewish minister. Yeah. Joshua the Jewish minister. What do you remember about him? Well, he was a fraud. <laughs> Would he claim, did, he, did he claim to be the reincarnated uh, Matthias, mm -hmm. the ancient apostle? Yes, some, some preposterous thing that Joseph Smith saw through him. And, and, and while conversing with him relates a brief history of the church, yeah. which contains a few little details here and there. Anything in particular you pick up on the 1835 account? Oh, well, one of the most exciting is just this little one-liner. I saw many angels yeah. right. in this vision. So in 35, he adds that he saw angels. And, I, and I've often wondered, you know, having read that, if it was uh, kind of like the you know, vision of, of Lehi when, when he saw God and, and, and there were you know, concourses of angels around. If it's that kind of a thing, or these were, you know, bodyguards, I, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's an interest. You know, what were those angels doing? Did they talk to him, or, or were they simply uh, in attendance in that well, you, vision? You think, and we'll talk yet about the theological significance of this vision, but think about all that he doesn't tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, consider what he says. He forbade me to join with any of them, and many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. All the things he must have learned. See, one of, one of the very distinctive things about Joseph Smith is, this is tough to do in this church, and that's to find an honest storyteller. <laughs> right? Joseph Smith is the only man that you can cite who would always uh, deliberately undertell his story. You expected more. Uh, well, he, de he, wouldn't, he never told you everything that took place. He told you what, to, uh, what the part of that story that laid the foundation for the understanding of, uh, that, uh, that he wanted you to have. But uh, instead of him embellishing the story, he never felt a need to do that. You have a wonderful contrast in the, at the end of the Pearl of Great Price, you remember, between Joseph's account of uh, the coming of John the Baptist and then this very beautiful and elaborate and uh, lyrical, uh, lyrical language of Oliver Cowdery, don't you? Joseph mm -hmm. wasn't given to that. Uh, he was very, very terse, but he always undertold. But I think and it's so interesting to see what he does tell that is right. That, that if we get, I mean, even that one line, see, we can start imagining yeah. how many of the things and somehow miss some of the most, the most remarkable and important aspect of see, this yeah, entire vision. Some of those vision. things would be distractors That's for what right. he wants us to see. I mean, I go back to, to what we read about Mary, the mother of Jesus, who kept all these things in her heart. And we say, mm. isn't that wonderful? And John. 
the, the Apostle John and what he doesn't tell in his testimony of Christ. I mean, we would think of wanting to turn to him to read about the Mount of Transfiguration, and he's the only one that doesn't mention that. I think or, there's some significance there. Or the there. sacrament. Or the sacrament, or even the suffering in Gethsemane. It's not there. Or the Quorum of the Twelve at General Conference. That, that's right. That's right. He doesn't, he doesn't titillate our imagination or helping us see well, I, what... I think it's like President Romney once said. He said, the Lord does not reveal things to blabbermouths. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my father who said that. <laughs> well, maybe he was quoting you. <laughs> Either way, Elder Romney, if he said it, was quoting my father. <laughs> what about the 1842 or the Wentworth letter? This one, uh, this one is a fascinating and beautiful uh, document as well. It's brief, but uh, what do you what do you learn from this one? Well, wh one one thing that uh, is apparent in that is is a what I call it a uh, softening of the language uh, about, you know, other churches were believing uh, incorrect, incorrect doctrine doctrines. as opposed to, you know, we're an abomination in my sight. And it was it's, going to a different group. Yeah, a different audience, and, and it was tailored to that audience. There's a, there's a detail in this one, interestingly enough, that is not in the other three accounts, namely, not only was the true church not on the earth, but the Lord would Re soon reveal it or restore it, and Joseph would be an instrument in, in, in doing that. Right. Interestingly, that's, that's not important. in our 1838 account, mm -hmm. our Pearl of Great Price account. And theologically, his announcement of, relative to the Father and the Son, that they exactly yeah. resembled each other in features and likeness. Mm -hmm. Surrounded with a brilliant light which eclipsed the sun at noonday. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, just maybe just a quick comment. Uh, what of the critics who, who like to have at us over this issue of differing accounts and differences in detail even between the the accounts of the first vision? What would you, uh, Camille, how would you come at that? How well, would you I answer I think of that? immediately Paul's account of his experience of the vision he had of Jesus Christ that we get in three different places in the book of Acts in, in 9, one, 22, and 26. Right. And, and, and there are differences in in details, and yet it, it, every one of them you can learn some additional kind of things like we've just seen from these different accounts. I, I think that seems to be very typical of real life first hand experiences and, and the audience you look at, who you're telling this to, we've seen different audiences to whom Joseph is telling that. I think that's, that's I, the, the second example I think of is the, are the four Gospels. I'll tell the story of the life and teachings of Christ, but there are differences in, in what is contained in them and some of the details that don't exactly line up perfectly, but they're each given to a different audience. And, and you, we are wise if we tailor our testimony, not that we, we don't fabricate details, but we tell those things that are appropriate to our audience that would be meaningful to our audience at whatever level they are or their background. The yes. Well, yes. And I, would, I would say this too and that is Joseph is <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> also learning what is important that is to say he's got it all together in his mind there's no question about that but as he is developing things may pop out that become more important from the perspective that he is at the time. Well, his I, own I, just as Nephi writing the small plates some 30 years after the fact has, uh, of, of the occurrence of those deeds, has a perspective on that as far as what matters and what I think should be told. So yeah. with Joseph Smith. Sure. Well, and, and if every one of the accounts agreed verbatim, one would become suspicious. You know, that it, it would be that, that, that would be a clear sign of fabrication to me rather than a, 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 a healthy difference between them. You know, every time I tell a yes. story, yes. Uh, I, it, it may be fundamentally factually true, but I, I talk about different things and, and I tailor it to the audience I'm talking to. It's We've dealt here with Joseph Smith's uh, 1832, 35, 38, 42 accounts. Uh, there were others. Uh, actually, the first published account of, of the first vision was by Orson Pratt, Orson Pratt. Uh, in Scotland, as I recall. Is that right, Joseph? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Anything about Brother Pratt's account as told to him by Joseph that comes to mind? He does some very interesting things. He, uh, he speaks uh, uh, quite eloquently about uh, uh, the, necessary, the necessity of finding the truth, as it were. Listen to this language. It also occurred to his mind that God was the author of but one doctrine, 
and therefore could not acknowledge but one denomination as his church, and that such a denomination must be a people who, believed, who believe and teach that one doctrine, whatever it may be, and build upon the same. He often reflected upon the immense number of doctrines now in the world which had given rise to many hundreds of different denominations. And then, then after that he talks about how, uh, how uh, uh, Joseph did not want to uh, trust his uh, salvation to uh, the fallibility of man. Hmm. Uh, that he wanted an answer from the heavens, you see. It's that account, too, that I think is so beautiful. The greatest fear Joseph had as the light began to descend, remember what he says? The great fear that the fire, as it were, would consume the forest in flames. So there we're talking about the nature of the glory of God's appearance. Now he concludes this again, uh, like that 1830 account, uh, at some future time be made known to him the fullness of the gospel. And he says, after which the vision withdrew, le leaving his mind in a state of calmness and peace indescribable. Beautiful. Beautiful description of uh, the spirit of revelation. Let's go. Yes, Camille. I have to say one more thing that I think some of those details that are the differences between the accounts are ones that really are insignificant. And it, it seems like that they weren't so important. I get the feeling from that first 1832 account, he wasn't... He didn't know that how old he was was going to be Initial quoted for, forever yeah. and ever. And it was around this particular time, and it seems like as it becomes more important in the church that he may have done some more calculation and mm -hmm. was able to say spring of 1820, but he didn't do that in 1832. Good point. He yeah. usually said about whenever yeah. he, said he gave ages. Yeah. That wasn't an, the issue with him. That's right. And, and in the first one, he is emphasizing the message of Christ. So it's, it's not important to him at that point that the Father appear. Later on, it becomes very important for him to communicate the Father was there as well as the Son. Good. Let's turn to Joseph Smith history. Let's read what uh, are, are terribly significant verses. Richard, if we could have you read, uh, starting in verse 15, and have you read through verse 17. Indeed. After I had retired to the place where I had previously designed to go, having looked around me and finding myself alone, I knelt down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. I had scarcely done so when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me and had such an astonishing influence over me as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me for a time as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. You know, at this point, uh, we haven't said anything yet about uh, satanic influence. If we begin talking in a few moments, as we will, about great lessons learned from the first vision, this is one of the earliest, is it mm -hmm. not? He learns of the actual reality of a satanic being. Yeah, he knows it. And but, it's not just a force, but an actual person. That's right. That's important. It isn't just some Ethereal. idea, uh -huh. some, some theory for explaining why things go bad. This was an actual being. Yeah, let me, let me read that one. But exerting all my power to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into to despair and abandon myself to a destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world who had such marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being. Just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which gradually, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description. Standing above me in the air, one of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. From that account, what stands out in your mind as far as things that are theologically significant about the first vision? There are a host of things here, but I, I, I need to point this out to you. What was the first word spoken by God in this dispensation? 
calling Joseph by Your name. Your name, Joseph. <laughs> Is that not a perfect way to begin <laughs> a dispensation? <laughs> a dispensation. We can forgive God. <laughs> yeah. No, no. But that, the, that, personal, that's, the personal no, nature there's, there's, of There's that. two things that are important here. One is, yes, God knew him by name, mm -hmm. by his given name, his first name. And that's the way every uh, angel and every vision begins. It's an, it isn't, an interesting... Hey, Dean Millet, it's an interesting it's, statement uh, about the nature of God from the very beginning. Yeah. God our is, relationship with Him. But uh, again, even to the finest detail, as you uh, paint this uh, great picture of the restoration, the boy bears the right name, you see, and it was prophesied that his name would be Joseph, this great old Hebrew name that means he who gathers, he who gathers for God, uh, and so we introduce uh, uh, this great dispensation of the gathering, in effect, with that announcement, you see. Every detail of this is just absolutely perfect. What else? What comes through here? I am impressed that as God chooses to reveal Himself, He reveals Himself in glory. And what I mean by that is, as we know, resurrected beings can choose whether or not to reveal themselves in glory. Jesus was not a resurrected being, but he was God on earth, took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there he was transfigured. They were also transfigured. But with them, there was an imposition given to them. There was no imposition given to Christ. That scintillating, glorious being on there was his nature that he chose at that time to reveal to them. So. These beings can choose to reveal themselves gloriously when they choose. And therefore, I think it's important, it seems to be important, that we understand that God reveals himself as a person of glory. Uh, it's interesting, uh, in, in Moses, Moses tells us, I was cut up into an exceeding high mountain. Uh, the glory of God was upon me. Th this doesn't mean favor. A lot of people say the glory of God is his divine favor. He likes somebody. If you come into God's favor, then he gives you revelation. This is going beyond that. This, this is connecting with the idea that the glory of God is intelligence, or in other words, light and truth. Light being capacitating power, that, that which is a, allows us or gives us ability that we do not normally have, and then the truth that flows or accompanies that power. God here then, I see, is embodying then this fullness of glory and reveals that to Joseph Smith so that Joseph Smith understands that, yes, though God is man, he is also more than man. And think about how much a role that concept plays in Joseph Smith's ministry and teachings thereafter or, or throughout the prophets. I was thinking first of Isaiah's uh, language, the language where Isaiah asked in chapter 33, who shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who shall sit in everlasting burnings? or the prophet Joseph himself at the end of his ministry saying, God himself is a consuming fire, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I mean, you think about what he says of the King Follett sermon as he's trying to give comfort to the family. He says, how consoling to the mourners to know that uh, when your loved one is called upon to pass uh, beyond the veil of death, he shall yet come forth to dwell in everlasting burnings. Well, you've got to know a little doctrine for that to be consoling, you see what I mean? Uh, uh, everlasting burnings is descriptive of what we would call the divine nature of God. Uh, think of the vision of the celestial kingdom. What, how, how is it described? Uh, a fire, a flame, the Father and the Son, you know, and so I appreciate and, and that. And it's particularly powerful after this description of Satan and the power of Satan, because this power of Satan is not just something that he thinks, oh, is kind of wimpy, like Moses had that experience after having seen the Savior. Yeah. But, but mm -hmm. he's, he's just saying, I don't know, he thought he was doomed. And then in contrast to that, I think it's a wonderful reconfirmation of there is one greater than all that is here, and, and the power of God supersedes any other power. Let's don't then, let, let, let's, let's piggyback on that. So one thing that's revealed is the divine nature of God, this, this power, this influence, this glory. Let, let's now deal, though, with, with the nature of God's corporeality. And let's be strict and honest with ourselves. What do we know that Joseph Smith knew about God's physical body in this experience? I, this, this, again, yeah. is the illustration of Joseph as the very disciplined storyteller. 
Joseph did not come and say, I saw the Father and the Son. So if you were cross-examining him, you'd say, oh, and did, was there a soundtrack with this uh, vision? Or were they wearing name tags? How did you know? He didn't say that. He simply so said, I saw two personages. See? But uh, that's significant. That establishes for uh, us the fact that uh, they are personages. They resemble men. They have the features and likeness of men. And they are, in every sense of the word, as separate and distinct as the two of you are, you see. Getting, getting back to your question, though, I, I, I don't know what Joseph Smith knew and what he didn't know. But I, I don't know that he had to know that God had a body as tangible as man's in that instance. Now, well, Joseph, I wouldn't know. argue it against it. I, he, I, well, he may I, have. He, he, well, knew he, knew that, he, he knows they, he knew they were being. Yeah, he, that he, they had he something. He didn't reach out and, and right. handle it. He didn't uh, imply in any way that he did. He just told you strictly what he saw. I saw mm -hmm. two personages. Which seemed to be sufficient. But, yeah, yeah. Which alone, as we would say, it's monumental. It's monumental, and it does clear away cobwebs of the past as far as what the Christian world is believing about the distinct natures of the Father and the Son. And then in the other accounts who exactly resemble each other in features and likeness. So we don't know for sure if he knew then that the Father had a body. Uh, well, he has a body. Whether he, he has a corporeal, but, physical but, body. But if it's, if it's this kind of a body, he doesn't okay. know that. Yet. In, yeah. in doing a little, a little research on this, though, it, it is interesting uh, that uh, a Reverend Truman Coe, a Presbyterian minister uh, in Kirtland, Ohio, in writing about the Latter-day Saints in 1836, says this. He says, these Latter-day Saints have some strange beliefs. They even teach that God has a body. Now, that says to me that the saints are teaching it at least by 36 and, and, and perhaps before then. We certainly know it by the time of Nauvoo, where Joseph Smith declares it uh, in Ramos, Illinois, is it? The father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. Yeah, there's been a notion that uh, some have tried to popularize that in the early years, Joseph believed in the, the God of the creeds, the God of the sectarian world. God of the Trinity. Yeah, and uh, frankly, the facts of the matter simply don't bear that out. No, they don't. Here's That's a statement I found in that regard from Joseph Smith himself, and this is, <clears throat> This is after the King Follett sermon, so this is not long before his death. He says, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage, Jesus Christ a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. That's a pretty strong statement. Yeah. I've always declared that, he said. Well, it makes sense since he learned that at the age of 14. Yes. yes. Now, there's another important doctrinal uh, uh, principle taught here, and that's the relationship between the Father and the Son. Okay. That is the manner in which the question was answered. Uh, Joseph didn't come out of the grove and say that the, I went and asked the question and uh, God answered or that the Father answered. The answer properly had to come through Jesus Christ. Now, uh, that's very important. From, from the day of the fall, from the point in time when Jesus Christ, when, when, when Adam, after Adam introduces uh, uh, the fall, then uh, we need a savior. And from that point forward, all the revelations of salvation must come to us through that same channel, through the savior. And, and yet and the so father has a very important role here in introducing he, his To testify of who the son is and that that right. is the channel. And so in complete compliance with this, great principle that stretches from the fall down to uh, the end of eternity, I suppose. Uh, Joseph, this is my beloved son. Now you listen up. You get all your answers through this channel. But it wasn't like the father came and said, now let me, I better handle this one. This, this is, is important. This is big. This is important. So I'll handle this one. And then you take over a little later on and handle the, the minor questions, you see. Uh, this is my beloved son, so, you here. So we learned yeah. something about priesthood government <clears throat> yeah. in this early vision. The order of heaven, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. okay. I thought of something that's easy to pass over, too, if we don't think it through, and that is early on, Joseph Smith, I mean, this is 1820, he learned something about the immortality of the soul. So he's a believer in life after death. If nothing else, before him stands a being that uh, is, uh, had been crucified, put to death, and he learns something about life beyond the grave. What else? I think one very important thing we learn that, that he mentions after the vision is 
He says, I, I came to know that, that what James said was true. Yes. Revelation is real. If someone wants to have wisdom from God, he can go to God and receive it. And notice years later he'll say something like this. If a man wants to gain knowledge from God, it's not through reading the experiences of others that he gets it, but it's by going to God directly. And that's, it's in that context that he says if a man could gaze into heaven five minutes, he would know more about life after death than if he'd read all the books written on the subject. He had had family experiences before him, but now he's had his own experience. Mm -hmm. Any other, any other things that stand out about the first vision? We haven't stated, of course, what he learns about other churches. Um, he learns that uh, the language of the 1838 statement is very strong language. All their creeds are an abomination in my sight. Now, I think we need to clarify. I mean, we, we don't want to sugarcoat this on the one hand, but we don't want to overstate it either. I don't think the Lord is, is, is condemning all people in other churches, obviously, but he is saying that the creeds trouble him. The creeds trouble him. Why? Because there is when, in those early Christian centuries, there is when we begin to unravel uh, and pull apart what the scriptures had plainly taught about the nature of God. And once we begin to, to dabble with the nature of God, everything else follows. The nature of God to man, God's ability to reveal himself, man's ability to know God, man's ability to become as God. And so all well, their creeds. Uh, God has reason to be just a little annoyed. They took God's body. They took his gender. They took his manhood. They took, they his, took his fatherhood. They took his passion. They robbed him of his family. Mm -hmm. They took everything away from him that is meaningful. Now, uh, he's doing got... so redefined man. And redefined man, his children. Yeah, they insulted all of his children. And right. blinded us about any potential that we and cut And have. cut off the association of his children mm -hmm. with him. Now, has he got a right to be just a little offended, a little upset about all of this? Uh, I think so. I think so. I think the language ought to be fairly strong. Mm -hmm. Or he doesn't have those passions that we're saying that uh, <laughs> that ought to be restored yeah, here. Sure. Yeah, right. And it is interesting too that uh, in in light of what Joseph Smith or uh, Joseph says about Joseph Smith, that God says, "This is my beloved son. He is the father again. He he is. This is my beloved son, which makes him the father. And now he's interacting with another son who's going to find out how glorious he is." and that he can have a relationship with the Father as that divine Son has. Good insight. Any, anything else as far as theological significance of the first vision? I'm sure there's much well, more. I think as much as we make a big point about this separate nature of these two separate beings, we still see Joseph Smith concluding he received his answer from God. I, mean, I think that that right. unity, no, that, that oh, it oh, is, yeah. Yeah, it, it's still, it is still he prayed to God and he receives an answer. The fact that Christ is the delivering that message to him does not negate did the not fact. Move him from that's the right. And I think that that, uni that unity that is um, established and, and reconfirmed here is is marvelous. That we see the the love and acceptance working together in so perfect years later, unity. people would say, "What did you learn?" He could say. God taught me such and such. Yes. And it didn't matter whether yes. it was the son or the father, God taught That's me. That's right. Now, I think it's significant too, in, uh, and you pick this up, for instance, uh, in the Wentworth letter, when somebody comes to Joseph and says, all right, now tell us where you're coming from. Tell us what it means to be a Latter-day Saint. Who are you? What are you? He sits down and he immediately starts to tell the story of the first vision. Mm -hmm. That's the foundation. That's where we begin. He was not squeamish about telling this story. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that's the pattern that we use again if we go out. There's no way in all the world that we can uh, represent our story or get across what happened and why we are what we are and, uh, and who we are, what our message is, if we don't have the courage of the, the story. Now, by way of summary, to this remarkable discussion uh, which must entail about something as significant as the first vision. Let me just close with two statements by leaders of the church. First from President Gordon B. Hinckley.
To me, it is a significant and marvelous thing that in establishing and opening this dispensation, our Father did so with a revelation of himself and of his Son, Jesus Christ, as if to say to all the world that he was weary of the attempts of men, earnest though these attempts might have been, to define and describe him. The experience of Joseph Smith in a few moments in the, in the grove on a spring day in 1820 brought more light and knowledge and understanding of the personality and reality and substance of God and his beloved son than men had arrived at during centuries of speculation. That's a remarkable statement. Very good statement. And then this one, which I think we all can appreciate from President J. Reuben Clark from the great talk, The Charted Course of the Church in Education. There are for the church and for each and all of its members two prime things which may not be overlooked, forgotten, shaded, or discarded. First, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father in the flesh, that he was raised from the tomb, a resurrected being, a perfect being, the first fruits of the resurrection. The second of the two things to which we must all give full faith is that the Father and the Son actually and in truth and very deed appeared to the prophet Joseph in a vision in the woods, that other heavenly visions followed to Joseph and to others, that the gospel and the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God were in truth and fact restored to the earth from which they were lost by the apostasy of the primitive church. These facts also, and each of them, together with all things necessarily implied therein or flowing therefrom, must stand unchanged, unmodified, without dilution, excuse, apology, or avoidance. They may not be explained away or submerged. Without these two great beliefs, the church would cease to be the church. And so we have in the first vision the beginning of the revelation of God to man in this day. And we can study it and come away appreciating more fully why the Lord would say something so profound to Joseph Smith as this, this generation shall have my word through you.